everyone here. Thanks for coming out. It's a little cooler. Maybe by the time we're done, the, the sanctuary will be nicely aired out. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. Um, so a, a handful of announcements. Um, first, thanks to everybody who brought in school supplies. Um, really appreciate it. They're going to go to the way station this week. So if you didn't bring them in and still want to, you have till Monday, Tuesday morning to bring them in. And, or you can just take it to the way station. That's fine too. Um, there is going to be a Swiss steak dinner, which is pretty amazing. There's no street there, but there's still Swiss steak. It is reservation only. It is prepay only. So, um, there's a, a purple form in the bulletin. We're sending out a print newsletter next week sometime. There'll be a form in there. Um, so it will be after the service on September 12th. That's a Saturday evening service. It's the outside service. So after the service, you can pick up dinner and take dinner home. It's in there Yeah. Oh. It's in here. But also be in the newsletter. Uh, I need some help. Um, we've been hosting a wonderful program called Glow all um, summer. On Thursday is their last meeting, and um, I opened my big mouth and promised to do a picnic barbecue for all of them. Because they're great, and there aren't that many of them. There's only 14 of them. And I can really use some help. We have hot dogs, we have hamburgers, um, but we could use some sides, we could use some brownies or something for dessert. Um, I could use someone to help me do some grilling. We need a grill. Um, I probably should have thought about this a little bit before I opened my big mouth, but. I also trusted that we would be able to come through and it, it's been an amazing ministry that we've been a part of. It's financially helped the church. They, it's a government sponsored program so they have money for rent so they've been paying rent, lots of rent. It's done great for these young women who've been part of the program. Mass is part of the program. Mokit's a leader in the program. So it's just been incredible. So let me know after the service if you can help, if you can uh, have a, a grill you can drop off, if you can make a side, or if you're willing to get in the trenches and help with some burgers, that would all be helpful. Uh, I am heading out of town on Saturday. Um, next week's service is a Saturday evening service. It's outside. Um, my good friend, he's a hub faculty member, Duffy Roberts, is going to um, be with us. He's an actor who's also a pastor. And during the summer, um, not during the summer, during the spring, as part of the class that he took, that he taught with the hub, he worked on a presentation of Job. And he really dove down into Job. And I have a suspicion that he's going to be doing his presentation of Job next Saturday night, which is phenomenal. Um, he's certainly going to be reflecting on everything he learned about Job as he dug way down into that character. Uh, then two weeks, I'm still gone. Uh, my good friend and elder from the East Palestine Church, Josh, is going to be here. He's going to be bringing the message. Josh is amazing. He's incredible. He's 
Well, I'm just going to say this. Josh has significant uh, mental disability. Uh, he's a champion special Olympian. He can't navigate from point A to point B for the life of him. Uh, but his heart for God is so incredible, and his just brief understanding of Scripture is so incredible. Josh started coming with other folks from East Palestine to regional gatherings of presbytery where they were studying scripture together. And after about the third gathering, I realized that all the other people in the room, all these elders and pastors from all these other churches, the second Josh opened his mouth, they all shut up. Josh isn't very complicated. What he's going to preach isn't going to be very complicated or very sophisticated. But when Josh opens his mouth, the gospel and the love of Christ come out. So come and support Josh. That's all I'm going to say. Just make the point to be here and support Josh. It's, he's never, he's been to Columbia now. When I started his house, Josh didn't even know Columbia existed. He, it was off his radar. So this is a big thing for him. So come and support him and be blessed by the word of God. That's enough announcements. Wow, we haven't had that many announcements in months. Let's sing. In my heart, there rings.
the last few weeks, we've been looking at ancient Israelite heroes and covering some of their stories. I'm going to shift gears a little bit this week and look instead at the object. An object that was so important to the ancient Israelites that almost in reading the stories of Exodus and Judges and Samuel, it almost becomes a character unto itself. It also has a movie out a long time ago with Indiana Jones. Um, we're going to look today at the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. So I was a Boy Scout. And when we were in Scouts, and I think Scouts still have this, we each patrol had a, a patrol box. It was a, a plywood box, and it held all of our camping equipment. It had two long metal um, poles. They became legs when you set the box up as a camp kitchen, but the poles where you could carry the box, and you always made sure that the two youngest and all the scouts were assigned to carry the box. That's how the patrol box worked. The Ark of the Covenant was the Israelites' patrol box. It was their spiritual patrol box. It was a wooden box, four feet long, got two feet wide, two feet high, and had long set of poles for carrying it. Now, unlike our Boy Scout patrol box. The Ark of the Covenant was decorated with gold. It had sculptures of winged creatures on the top. And when it became set up in the uh, tabernacle in the Israelites' portable worship space, it became the throne of God. So that kind of tells you how the Israelites' relationship with God was that they just gave him a box to sit on. And God was fine with that. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant was a copy of the Covenant of the Ten Commandments, was a sample of the Holy Manna from the desert that had been preserved, and Aaron's staff which was also placed in the box. Um, this box was not unique. Well, the Ark of the Covenant has not ever been found despite Indiana Jones' best efforts. Um, similar boxes have been found through the Middle East from about the same time that were portable worship shrines for various other deities. Where the Ark was, God was. The ark led the people through the desert. It led them into battle. But once the Israelites settled down into the promised land, they just sort of parked the ark up on a hill in its tent and kind of just forgot about it. Just sat there and got a dust. Eventually, King David is part of his consolation of power. He brings the ark to Jerusalem, and King Solomon puts it into the temple, and there it stays until at some point it disappears. It goes into the temple, and then it's gone. Well, it's parked on this hill, a place called Shiloh, it's under the care of a priest named Eli. We're going to talk about him in a couple of weeks. His sons, Hophni and Phineas, were horribly corrupt. They abused the power of the ark. And during that time, the ark itself goes on an adventure, kind of on its own. It's a, it's a great little story, and we're going to read an abridged version of it from 1 Samuel chapters 4 to 6. As I read this, as Mike plays later, 
Think about where does God live for you? Where does God live for you? So here's the story of the adventure that the ark took. In those days, the Philistines mustered for war against Israel, and Israel went out to battle against them. And they encamped at Ebenezer, the Philistines encamped at Apeth. They drew up lines against each other. When the battle was joined, the Israelites were defeated by the Philistines. And they realized that they'd forgotten the ark. So the next day, the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant. The two sons of the priest Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark to take care of it. When the Philistines heard that the Ark was in the Israelite camp, they became afraid. But they took courage, and Israel was once again defeated. There was great slaughter at the hands of the Philistines, and the ark of God was captured. When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod, and then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of their god, Dagon, and they placed it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, they found their god, Dagon, fallen his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Dagon was a statue, by the way, the Philistines made statues of their gods or idols. So they took Dagon and they put him back in his place. But when they rose early the next morning, Dagon again had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and struck them with tumors, both in Ashdod and all the territory around. And when the inhabitants of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us. For his hand is too heavy upon us and upon our God, Dagon. So they moved the ark of the God of Israel to Gath. But after they had brought it to Gath, the hand of the Lord was against that city, causing a very great panic. So they sent the ark of the God of Israel to Elkrin. But when the ark of God came to Elkrin, the people of Elkrin cried out, Why have they brought this around to us, the ark of the God of Israel, to kill us and our people. They sat therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of Israel and let it return to its own place that it may not kill us and our people anymore. For there was a deathly panic throughout the city. The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines for seven months. Then the Philistines called for their priests and their diviners and said, what shall we do with this ark of the Lord? Tell us what we should do to send it to its own place. The priests and the diviners said, get ready a new cart and two milk cows that have never borne a yoke, and yoke the cows to the cart and take the cows home away from them. Take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart, then send it off and let it go its way. And watch if it goes away to its own land, then it is God who has done us this great harm. But if not, then we shall know that it's not God's hand that struck us, but it just happened by chance. So the men did so. They took the two milk cows and they yoked them to the new cart, and they shut up the calves at home, 
And they put the ark of the Lord on the cart, and the box with some gifts on the cart, and the cows went straight into the direction of Israel. Along one highway, rowing as they went, they turned neither to the right nor to the left. The cart came into the field of Joshua and Beshmesh and stopped there. The people welcomed the ark, and they offered for offering and presented sacrifices so that day to the Lord. Yet they too, these Israelites, were terrified of the ark. So they sent it further away to the shrine at Kerith Kerith, where it remained for some time. That is the story of the ark's great adventure in the land of the Philistines. Well, like plays, think about where does God live for you? Ark, and the old ark 
it belonged to God. And when that temple is destroyed by the Romans, neither Jews nor the emerging Christians see any reason to rebuild the temple. It's still not rebuilt. Jesus would go to the temple, but he began talking differently about where God is. My Father and I are one, he would say. His very presence with a person in a community meant that God was near. His disciples would find they had the same power, that when they were present, God was present to. The Apostle Paul would then put this into words saying, anyone who is united in the Lord through their baptism becomes one spirit with him. Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit which we have from God. We are not on our own. We are the body. We are the body. That's when the Israelites began to realize once they lose the ark, once the temple gets destroyed, they began to realize that God wasn't in this constructed place but was in this created place in that in those beings they became the box we are the box our bodies have become the ark god's holy temple working within us god transforms our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh we become filled with the holy spirit we become linked directly to god from Christ directly, we experience in our lives, in our bodies, in our souls, God's promise of healing, hope, renewal, and love. When we live our lives as Christ lived his life, our neighbors experience healing, hope, renewal, and love through us. But just as the Israelites had to be careful with the ark, we have to be careful with how we nurture and care for the God within us. The Israelites lose the ark. Before that, they neglect the ark. We, too, can lose our sense of God within. It happened to me over the last few weeks. It's not like losing a baseball in the woods where you watch it leave the bat and it arcs through the yard and then you see it heading straight for that patch of brambles and poison ivy. And you know that you're going to Walmart to buy a new ball tomorrow because you're never getting that ball back. The sense of God's presence within can just sort of slip away. One day we're feeling linked and connected with God, the next we're lost, we're alone, we're disconnected. Sometimes, often, we don't even realize it. I've known Christians who become so separated from the Christ within that they become walking advertisements for the devil even as they're proclaiming Jesus. You probably run into a few of those yourself. When we let the anger and the hatred, the fear and the greed that pollute our society begin penetrating into our inner spiritual core, we begin losing sense of Christ within. We begin losing the ability to be Christ to others. We can easily begin worshiping the idols, the wealth, the power, the control, 
the selfishness that surround us. We covet and we lust. We quarrel and we divide ourselves into factions. The Christ within becomes buried by filth, just as I imagine that the Ark of the Covenant, as it sat neglected in that shrine, became dusty, became dirty, became just a box. A box. Buried by the filth, the Christ within no longer shines out. We no longer represent Christ to others. We no longer feel connected to Christ ourselves. Here's the thing about the Israelites and their art. When they were in the desert, when they were dependent on God to guide them each day, the ark was taken care of. Its gold shone, its wood was polished. But once the Israelites felt secure, they began to neglect the ark. They got locked in a room, shoved in a corner, a dusty relic of a distant time. In a couple of weeks, we're going to read that famous story about Samuel and Eli when Samuel is asleep and hears God calling him. We often don't realize in the story that Samuel is actually sleeping in the room where the Ark of the Covenant has been stacked. That's how low the caretaking had become. The little boy is curled up in a mat on the same closet where the Ark of the Covenant is. Within through neglect. Instead of rooting myself in scripture and prayer, I let the pandemic time disrupt my discipline. Instead of seeking out love, joy, peace, and kindness, I allowed myself to wallow in the violent hatred of social media. Instead of opening myself up in generosity, I allowed fear to close my heart. And I know I'm not alone because many conversations I've had over the last week, I've heard similar stories. Fear, depression, anger, grief, all clouding our sense of God within. Luckily, for me, for each of us, just because we lose our sense of God within doesn't mean it's not there. It is a treasure preserved in clay jars by God who has placed himself inside our very fragile being. This treasure isn't ours, it belongs to God. The Philistines capture the ark, but they don't control God. That's why the ark still has its power. That's why the God within is still there. It doesn't come from us. It comes from God. We actually can't lose it. It can't be stolen. It can't be destroyed. Always there to be rediscovered, to be seen by others. When we consciously seek out that which is holy, that which is right, when we clean and polish and care for the holiness that is within, we fill ourselves with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. These are what polish the holiness that is with you. These are what connect us with God. And when we fill our lives with that, we experience 
experience God within us and others, others can see that too, that it radiates out, transforming not only our lives, but our That's a little thinking about the art. And we're going to sing again as we come to the communion table. Take my life and let it be.
This is the Lord's table. It's not the table of the First Presbyterian Church or even of the Presbyterian Church USA. All who seek to Jesus within, all who seek to be Jesus to those without are welcome at this table. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. We come to your table this morning, holy God, wounded and hurting by the sin of this world, by the sin of others, by the sins of our own nature. Put your healing blessing upon us. They will bring relief to those of us wounded in body and soul. Bring hope where horizons are limited by despair. Bring comfort to those who feel abandoned or alone. Bring love to those worn down by the world's evil. Lord, hear our prayers. Our prayers for ourselves. Our prayers for others. Our prayers of joy and our cries of lament. Lord, hear our prayers and hear our prayers. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this wine, and we joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. And upon these, your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share in this feast united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out in union with your church in heaven and on earth as the body of Christ in the world. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, with the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power the glory for her. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take ye, this is my body, give it for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to take your bread top the top if you haven't already. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. This is the blood of Christ, 
Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. We end our service with Go, my children, with your blessing. And do let me know if you can help out Thursday to bring a nice cookout final lunch for the young women in the global program. Let me know after the service. Amen.